So uh, for this week, if you look at the addendum, you will notice that uh, we are uh, reading um, a very um, short but uh, expressive and rather famous um, essay of Virginia Woolf's. Um, it's called The Death of the Moth. Um, and uh, Virginia Woolf, you may know uh, uh, perhaps um, as the author of A Room of One's Own. She was a, uh, an early uh, feminist uh, thinker who tried to carve out the space for female writers. So if you don't know anything about Virginia Woolf, it doesn't hurt to read a little bit about her in an online encyclopedia. This story, uh, or rather um, it's an essay that reads like a story, but it is uh, technically considered nonfiction. So it is just an account of a narrator watching a moth and reflecting upon the meaning of the moth's life and uh, in a larger context on life and death in general. And um, it was published in 1942, uh, published posthumously, meaning after Virginia Woolf's death. And um, it is one of the most widely read of her essays. So I'd like to share with you uh, what I want us to think about when we read The Death of the Moth. Of course, I hope you read the text first. It's very short. It's only a couple of pages. So read it first, pause this. If you haven't read it, read it, and then look at the analysis that I offered to you on the death of the moth. So here we are. Whoops, nope, that's the grammar quiz, which I will share with you. We didn't do that last week. It's not for marks, but I'd like you to uh, actually practice um, looking at uh, at the grammar quiz so that you are um, thinking about grammar when you uh, write your own text, the first uh, description assignment. So the death of the moth. Um, you'll see that the text is color coded. The color coding is meant to differentiate between the different modes um, of telling the information to the reader. So in yellow, the first, and um, I thank my supervisor, uh, Dr. Nakashu, for the color coding schema that he has provided. So um, uh, the yellow is uh, near or pure description. So what does that mean? It means that uh, the narrator tells you things about the moth that you can see, you can, uh, observe in uh, all the various ways that we observe objects in the world, so through the five senses, without emotional uh, reflection attached to it, right? So you can say the moth is this big, it, it is uh, this color, its wings look like this, it flutters like that, etc. right? So um, in gray, you have general or common reflection, meaning that this reflection is not necessarily attributed to the narrator, the person observing the moth, but it's a general statement of uh, reflection about the object. In fuchsia pink here, you have context. And if you think about contextual information, um, when we want to make sure that somebody understands us, um, uh, for example, culturally, you may say, I was born in St. Petersburg. And to not mislead uh, somebody who, for example, lives in the United States uh, and would think that I am referring to a city in the United States of America, um, I would say St. Petersburg, Russia. Russia uh, would be contextual information to point to a place that I mean specifically, right? Um, similarly, if I describe something about an activity that I'm doing, I could give background information that allows the reader to understand something about that activity if they, for example, know nothing about it. So context, the very first sentence in this text is contextual. It reads, Moths that fly by day are not properly to be called moths. So um, 
this immediately makes you think about what you know about moths. And if you think about moths at all, you may um, imagine some late summer night, like right now, um, or early fall, autumn, uh, evening when there is a light somewhere outside and the moth is attracted and flutters to the light and you think, yeah, it's a night creature. We typically see moths more often at night. So the author, Virginia Woolf, posits this contextual piece of information at the beginning of the essay to say, moths who fly during the day are not exactly the same as the night moths. So why is this important? Well, then you have this general or common reflection that continues this thought about these um, atypical or less common kinds of moths. So they do not excite that pleasant sense of dark autumn nights and ivy blossom, which the commonest yellow underwing asleep in the shadow of the curtain never fails to rouse in us. And that's a long and grammatically complex sentence, right? They is a pronoun that's referring to moths, right? And uh, we are told that they, the moths that are the night creatures, the autumn kind of creatures, um, they essentially um, have some kind of uh, uh, nostalgic connection to a, uh, a mood that uh, an autumn season evokes. So she's starting to build associations using these descriptive words to talk contextually and reflectively about moths as creatures. So the next sentence, very short. So see, she var varies the sentence length. This is an important uh, writing strategy for keeping the attention of your reader. If all your sentences are short, um, for example, moths usually fly at night. Moths who fly during the day are not the same. Uh, they are hybrid creatures. If you make sentences short again and again and again, it'll sound quite robotic and not um, uh, as eloquent. If you have super long sentence after super long sentence, what you'll discover is that you'll lose your reader. And you yourself, having had to read maybe something um, uh, from 19th century novels with long descriptions of mountains and parks and um, uh, banquet halls and balls where ladies and gentlemen went to dance. And if these sentences continue to be um, really taxing on your attention because of their length, then what happens is that you end up um, uh, really losing the reader's attention. So notice sentence length variation in your own writing as well. One first strategy for thinking about your writing in a critical way. So they are hybrid creatures. This is referring to moths that fly by day. And this is a theme in the text. Neither gay like butterflies nor somber like their own species. So now you have a kind of binary set up uh, meaning two terms. One is butterflies and they're happy and uh, joyous uh, creatures. And then uh, the moths that are the night creatures are somber. Okay. If this is a new word, I recommended this um, in the last class last week. Every time you encounter a new word in the text that you're reading, you should look it up, write it down in your notebook, building your vocabulary. So, Nevertheless, the present specimen with his narrow hay-colored wings fringed with a tassel of the same color seemed to be content with life. Here's our first instance of a figuration or you can say essentially that non-focalized figuration is a kind of coloring uh, of uh, the object with emotion. By the way, if you don't live in Canada, we spell coloring with an O, an extra letter in there, coloring, C-O-L-O-U-R for color. Um, and that's the Canadian standard, standard for spelling we expect. 
So pay attention to these uh, minor details. Um, so the heart in green seemed to be content with life. So this is an emotion attributed to the moth. The moth seems to be happy with its life. That's all that the narrator is telling us. Then pure description continues. It was a pleasant morning. So setting up a description of when this is happening. It was a pleasant morning, mid-September, mild, benignant, yet with a keener breath than that of the summer months. So what does that mean? Keener breath. What is a keen breath? There's so much you can um, take from each sentence in terms of what Wolf uh, is presenting us with, the kind of picture that she's painting for us with these words. Such vigor came rolling in from the fields and the down beyond that it was difficult to keep the eyes strictly turned upon the book. Now, again, this is a kind of moment of emotion described uh, in indirect reference to the mood or the atmosphere, right? So it was difficult to read the book. There was something in the air that was distracting. The rooks, too, were keeping one of, the, of their annual festivities, soaring round the treetops until it looked as if a vast net with thousands of black knots in it had been caught up in the air, which after a few moments sank down, slowly sank down upon the trees until every twig seemed to have a knot at the end of it. So again, um, you can compare this to impressionist paintings where you see a tree with blots of black ink and they represent birds and the detail is not finely depicted or sketched out, but it's creating an image for us that we can understand and relate to, right? So what happens through the first paragraph is that the setting is established, the context of the object is established and um, not much about the actual moth is given to us yet. Um, the second paragraph, you see we get a new color introduced, the baby blue, um, indicates uh, the author's response to what is happening. Okay, so here's an example of that. So after describing a little bit more um, of what's happening in the field and then the pure description of the moth, um, moth fluttering from side to side of the square of the window pane, um, one could not help watching him, could actually be in green, but in any case, here's the new interesting part. One was indeed conscious of a queer feeling of pity for him for the moth. Slightly sexist gender, how do we know it was a boy and not a girl? Um, but this is 1940s after all. So, or when, when this text was published, it was 1940s and um, sexist like, language was very much with us. When you meant, when you said human, you would say he as a pronoun to refer to all humanity. We don't do that anymore. So, uh, the possibilities of pleasure seemed that morning so enormous and so various that to have only a moth's part in life and a day moth's at that appeared a hard fate, and his zest in enjoying his meager opportunities to the full, pathetic. So there are two adjectives um, that Wolf offers us uh, that help us to see what the author's response to the object is. One of them is pity, the other one is pathetic. Okay, so both are related in the attitude of feeling sorry for the moth, right? And the meager opportunities, that's another good phrase here, the opportunities that a moth has compared to a human or even a horse out in the field. He flew vigorously to one corner of his compartment and after waiting there a second, flew across to the other. What remained for him but to fly to a third corner and then to a fourth. That was all he could do, right? Um, so if you look at the stuff in yellow, this is uh, what Wolf is doing in the mode that we can describe as pure description. 
meaning that descriptive um, words are used to construct sentences that give us a good sense of the object and the object's location in the world. All the other stuff and the other colors is what we will work on developing further in your own assignment through reflections upon the object. And I'll give you an example of my own um, text that I created to show you what you can do um, uh, to approach your first descriptive assignment. So I won't read all of the rest of the Wolf text um, for you. I'd like you again, once again, I stress, read it at least once, watch the lecture, then maybe reread it to think about how Virginia Woolf constructed her text before you begin writing your own description. So a little bit further in the story um, about this moth, we get um, a, uh, a kind of shift, a turn in the narrative to um, initiate the conflict which will then resolve the end of the story. Okay, so uh, it begins with after a time, he settled on the window ledge in the sun. That's pure description. The emotional attachment to this um, that the uh, text is offering is that the reason that the moth sat down is because it was tired by its dancing around in the window pane. And this uh, baby blue stuff indicates once again what the author's response emotionally is to the moth sitting down because the moth is tired. So the response is, and the queer spectacle being at an end, I forgot about him. Then looking up, my eye was caught by him. So the author reflects upon the fact that uh, there is a moment of distraction from the moth and then refocusing on the moth. And uh, again, pure description, he was trying to resume his dancing. So the author notices that the moth is trying to do what it was doing before, but seemed either so stiff or so awkward that he could only flutter to the bottom of the window pane. And when he tried to fly across, it, he failed. So this is pure description. Again, notice after a time, the moth sat down, then he tried to resume his dancing and then tried to fly and failed. This is pure description of what's happening to the object of the story, which is the moth, right? The author reflects upon this and even wants to help the moth. Um, and then we get to the next paragraph where we see the author now describing the final moments of the moth's life, right? So the legs agitated themselves once more, pure description. And then the author reflects, I looked uh, as if for the enemy against which he struggled. So that's an interesting sentence. You know, you look at a moth, it's in the window and you see that it's not doing so well and you feel sorry for it. And then you look as if you are thinking, what is hurting the moth, right? An enemy, some kind of an enemy. But of course, this is metaphorical. The enemy is death itself. Um, so uh, you get a little more description. The author uh, uh, writes, I looked out of doors. What had happened there? Presumably it was midday and work in the fields had stopped. Stillness and quiet had replaced the previous animation. The birds had taken themselves off to feed in the brooks. The horses stood still. So. We don't have to learn literary terms for this, but there's a connection, a reflection, a, um, a moment of bringing together the external world um, that the author is describing, the stillness in the fields and what's happening with the moth, right? So uh, you may have, you know, um, read fairy tales or, other forms of uh, sort of uh, literary genres where when it's a scary uh, scene, it's at night in the dark. When it's a sad scene, it's raining. When it's a happy scene, it is um, a sunny and clear skies, right? So um, 
you know, we can call this in literary terms, pathetic fallacy, a connection between the external reality and the emotions that the narrative is expressing. But putting that aside, essentially the author is still describing something that is helping us to understand something about the moth. So um, when you look at the rest of it, try to think, why are there these switches between fear description and personal reflection and emotional coloration that the author is constructing here, okay? Um, in the final sentence, you know, this kind of interesting philosophical statement, oh yes, he, meaning the moth, seemed to say, death is stronger than I am. And of course, the whole piece asks us to reflect about the fact that death is stronger than anyone, whole cities of people, as the text suggests. So perhaps a slightly dark theme, but what I want you to really focus on in Virginia Woolf's essay is how she achieves this beautiful construction of a philosophical statement about life and death through something seemingly so insignificant as a tiny little moth, an insect, right? Um, so that takes skill, you know. It is a writing strategy that employs or uses a certain amount of talent in uh, writing that we consider literary, meaning there's metaphor, there are images and symbols. <clears throat> But when we write anything, um, we often use comparisons, analogies, we refer to things that people, other people know in the world. So I want you to think about that um, and to reflect upon what you know about constructing meaning in writing. What have you learned? And I forgot to say one more thing actually about the uh, Virginia Woolf text. Here's a quick exercise, a mental exercise I'm asking you to do. Um, can you think of a grammatical sentence that is uh, comprehensible on the level of grammar and yet it makes no sense, okay? So um, I'll ask you in our next live class to try to play with sentences that you construct and try to make them more or less sensical, make them more interesting by making them more creative, but to see how far you can push that kind of creativity. So for example, consider a famous um, example of a nonsensical sentence from Noam Chomsky. Um, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. And you might say, what? Right? And that's the point that Chomsky was making. You can have a properly constructed sentence, uh, meaning it follows grammatical principles of the English language, but it doesn't mean anything, right? Or, I mean, it means something, but it's not really useful meaning to anybody. So the structure of this sentence, and this is a kind of introduction, quick introduction to thinking about sentence structures from a grammatical perspective, you have an adjective, colorless, another adjective, green, right? Adjectives describe nouns. You have the noun, ideas, and the verb, sleep. So verbs, you know, you can't have sentences in English without verbs. So ideas, sleep. Okay. If we said cats sleep, that would be a sensical sentence, right? Humans sleep. But ideas, how can ideas sleep, right? So um, it's, it's perhaps a, some kind of metaphorical um, expression of an idea. But uh, how do you sleep furiously, right? Uh, that's an adverb describing the verb. So I hope the point is clear that you can have a sentence that looks like a sentence, but it doesn't say very much, right? And so you can say that, you know, writers creatively play with uh, meaning by taking it outside of its everyday usage, right? So one of my most, uh, favorite uh, sentences here. Um, 
find it. Uh, decked with a speck of light, something like that. Um, 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 um. There. So watching him, it seemed as if a fiber, very thin but pure, of the enormous energy of the world had been thrust into his frail and diminutive body as often as he crossed. No, no, that's not it. Mm. Having trouble finding it. Um, oh, here we go. This sentence. Think about the way it's constructed. It was as if, this is describing the moth, it was as if someone had taken a tiny bead of pure life. Like, what does that mean? A bead. You know, you know what a bead is, right? You know, for like making bracelets and, um, you know, a bead. Uh, you can refer to maybe a drop of water as a bead, right? This is analogies, comparisons. So it's as if someone's taken a tiny bead of pure life and decking it as lightly as possible with down and feathers had set it dancing and zigzagging to show us the true nature of life. So this is a very delicate uh, and very poetic description of the moth. Um, it's not pure description, right? It's figurative language, meaning poetic language, right? So I'm not asking you necessarily to practice uh, writing poetry in your description at all, but what I'm asking you to do is to consider how you describe an object. So to do this, I'm going to um, share with you another um, text which I had uh, composed to demonstrate to you what uh, somebody uh, could do to describe um, an object for the first part of the assignment. And this object in particular for me was, whoops, it's continuing to share the same file. I don't know why. Um, save. Okay. So share. Here we go. So when you read Stephen King's text for last week, he talked about rough comparisons and how to create a good description that speaks well to a, a reader who is intelligent and who uh, can follow your meaning on the page. But Stephen King um, warns you not to write uh, instructional, instructional manuals, um, meaning not to become too uh, focused on details and not to become uh, overburdened by the idea that you have to describe every aspect of the object. Um, he also uh, suggests that you have to take the task very seriously, right, and to write uh, the description in a way that shows care and attention to the object. So for your first assignment, this is what I want you to submit uh, before the end of this week. I need you just to write a paragraph uh, describing something that you know well. Okay, so it could be an object like your favorite childhood playground. It could be your bedroom, perhaps. It could be a particular specific object in your bedroom. Most coffee mugs are not very interesting, um, but perhaps, where did my good mug go? It's okay, I'll show you next time. Um, but imagine, you know, you have a particularly interesting uh, mug or you have an interesting, um, art object uh, in your room, or perhaps uh, it is even something from your imagination. So it could be something that you imagine, but it has to be concrete enough for you to describe. So avoid describing um, events, uh, because that'll be more like tell, telling a whole story. Instead of um, thinking about something large, rather think about something small. Okay, so it could be something like a pen. And here's my description of a pen, which I received as a gift. And it was connected to something I was studying uh, a couple of years ago with my teachers um, uh, in yoga. So you will see that there's one part that I highlighted in pink that is actually uh, 
already a little bit of um, emotional uh, connotation uh, that's not just pure description. The rest of the paragraph is pure description. And this is what I want you to produce. So here it goes. Here's my pen description. A wooden pen lay in front of me on a faux wood desk of a sterile windowless office. The caramel barrel of this word conjurer was handcrafted by a guy named S. Barker. The inscription of his name was on the butt end of the pen, followed by the pound sign and then the serial number of the specimen, 10271. The trimming of the pen was true metal, unlike most pens made today with plastic alloys, like this one, for example. In my hand, the whiskey hue and the hefty weight of the writing wand gave me strength to open the communication with a dear friend. So notice this is a description already of something more than just pure description. It is a significance of why this pen is important to me. The pen was given to me, that's somewhat contextual, but still describing where the pen came from. The pen was given to me by a girl in Miami when we studied the meaning of the first sutra in Patanjali's book, which reads, Atta Yoga Anushasana. Okay, so your object could be anything you think is worthy of describing carefully. It also has to be something that you can describe in a way that feels like it's worthy of sharing with the world. So think about the moth. Most of us would look at a moth and not even think twice about its significance, right? We might not think that a moth deserves to be written about. If you choose to write about a moth, the way Virginia Woolf had done, then there's something that you already have of an idea, a bigger idea for why this object is important in the world. For me, this pen has a connection to the bigger idea of the importance of yoga in my life and uh, in the lives of students who study yoga with me, right? So for me, this pen has significance and therefore I can take a lot of um, care and attention to try to describe it as best as I can. Notice the different adjectives and the different analogies that I used in order to create um, this description. I use colors to describe what the pen looks like. I describe uh, or rather create a contrast of how the pen seems really um, authentic and unique to me. It even has its unique co uh, uh, code or, or number, serial number, as opposed to a faux wood desk, a fake wood desk, um, you know, these IKEA things that uh, are mass produced um, in a sterile windowless office. So I'm contrasting something that I think has life as opposed to something that is quite boring or not as lively. Um, and I'm connecting this all to the moment of beginning the study of yoga, okay? So this description is dear to me. I crafted it when I was contemplating Virginia Woolf's text and how she managed to write something so beautiful about a simple moth. And I encourage you to take some time to actually enjoy this assignment. Don't think, oh my God, I, I don't like creative writing. Think, I can describe an object in the world in a way that other readers would find interesting. So that's your first assignment due this week. After we do that, um, we might also want to consider what it means to uh, create emotional connections to the world. So we'll talk about this a little bit later, but part of what really uh, enables you to write better is a good sense of grammar and good control over grammar. So for the last part of today's lecture, here's what uh, I want you to look at. This is a uh, very, very simple um, kind of grammar quiz that I created several years ago to try to get my students to think about um, the construction of uh, English sentences. And uh, I'll put it up on the screen. 
uh, in a moment. Once again, the sharing seems to be glitching today. I apologize about that. Um, grammar quiz. And you have it posted under your course documents as well, so you can take a look. Here it is, it's opening on my screen. Why is it not opening on Zoom? Let me see, let me test that again. Okay, now it works, all right. So um, this is just for fun, as I said. Please don't think that I'm judging your knowledge of grammar. I will pay attention to what you know about grammar and we will work through your own individual work and try to correct as many errors as possible. But first, think about parts of speech. Fill this out, tell me what you think these definitions are and the answers are things like adjectives and adverbs, verbs and nouns and prepositions and articles and so on. Okay, then just check your spelling. There, there, or they are, right? Fill them into here, we'll take this up in our class next time. Um, a little bit more on spelling of words that are commonly misspelled. And then this is the more challenging section. I want you to identify uh, the simple subject in uh, a sentence like this. In the morning, the sun peaked over the distant mountains. So in the morning, I can give you a hint, is not the simple subject of the sentence. To identify a subject, you have to say, who is doing the action in the sentence? So. What's the verb? What's the action? Peaked, to peak. So the simple subject, the answer is the sun, okay? I want you to do that for the rest of the sentences. And if you're not sure, try not to Google this, um, but rather think it through. And it's better that you make a mistake and then we talk it through and I correct it rather than you just find answers online. Finally, correct all the grammatical errors, including spelling, punctuation, and uh, uh, verb tenses in this little paragraph, okay? So I want you to do this on your computer or print it out and write it down, and then we'll take this up as a little bit of a brush up on grammar when we meet next time. I'm going to send an email to ask you uh, what time you would prefer to meet, but for now you have an important task for your first assignment, to review uh, what it is that you think Virginia Woolf does in her pure description of the moth, and then to choose an object and describe it as best as you can um, in order for your readers to be able to picture it in their minds. Thank you so much for listening, uh, and um, I am looking forward to our office hour on Thursday, and um, please, uh, submit your description assignment on Blackboard under assignments, not by email. I look forward to seeing you again. Have a wonderful week.